So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications here for the History Center and also the coordinator of our author talk series. I am so excited to be welcoming Atlanta author Colleen Oakley to discuss her newest book, The Invisible Husband of Frick Island. And she will be in conversation with fellow author Jill Santopolo. You can purchase a signed copy of The Invisible Husband of Frick Island from local independent bookstore, Foxtail Bookshop. I'll be posting a link to do that in the chat. And also uh, Colleen's gonna be at Foxtail this Thursday, May 27th, signing copies. So if you would like to get your copy personalized, you have your chance. Um, just when you order it from Foxtail, there'll be a comment section where you can add um, your personalization request and she will be doing that on Thursday. So if you have not already purchased your copy, I can't think the better thing to do to kick off your long Memorial Day weekend this weekend. <laughs> so uh, Colleen will also be taking your questions this evening. We do that through the Q&A. Um, so if you have a question for Colleen, please submit it in the Q&A and Jill will do her best to get to as many as she can uh, towards mm -hmm. the end of our program tonight. So just a brief introduction to both of our guests tonight, though I'm sure they need very little introduction. Colleen Oakley is a USA Today bestselling author. If you were there too, Close Enough to Touch, and Before I Go. Her books have been named Best Books by People, Us Weekly, Library Journal, and Real Simple, and have been long listed for the Southern Book Prize. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with her husband, four kids, and the world's biggest lapdog. She's in conversation with Jill Santopolo tonight. Jill Santopolo received a BA in English Literature from Columbia University and an MFA in Writing from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. She's the author of three successful children's and young adult series, and works as the associate publisher of Philomel Books, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers Group. She travels the world to speak about writing and storytelling. She is the New York Times bestselling author of More Than Words, The Light We Lost, a Reese Witherspoon book club pick, and she lives in New York City. Her newest book, which is also just out, is called Everything After. Colleen, Jill, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited that you're able to be with us virtually here in Atlanta. Thank you. And Colleen, thank you for, for letting me be part of your book launch. This is so exciting. Jill, thank you. You know, I'm the biggest fan of yours and I'm so, so happy that you agreed to do this. Thank you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I was actually saying to Claire before that I'm so jealous of everyone who is yet to read this book because it's so oh. much fun and it's so awesome to read and it's so page turny. So so everybody, if you have not yet read this book, seriously, go get it this weekend. You will not be sorry. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So I have a whole bunch of questions for you because I just, when I read this book, I had all these questions and I wrote them all down and I'm very excited to ask them. Um, <laughs> but also everybody else, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A right down there. And um, when I'm done with my questions, I will ask your questions. Um, all right. So here's my very first one, Colleen. I have this theory that authors' brains are, are like blenders of different things that they've seen or hear about or read about in their real life. And you kind of like throw all those pieces into your brain and it blends it and then um, a novel comes out. So if your brain is that blender, what pieces of your reality went into this novel? Oh my God, I love that metaphor. That is so much what novel writing is like. Although I wish it was as easy as turning on the blender and then just having a book. But you and I both know it takes a little longer than that. Um, yeah, so I, I would say two main things um, in, in real life are what gave me the idea for this book. And the first is a real life island um, in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay called Smith Island, which is what Frick Island is based on. Frick Island is a fictional island um, that I made up, but it's very much based on a real island called Smith Island. And Smith Island is a, is a tiny place. Um, I first went there about 20 years ago with my grandparents who lived in Salisbury, Maryland. And they said, you have to go to this, you know, this place, Smith Island. They have this cake and that, you know, it's you have to go by boat and it's just this really fascinating place. And it was fascinating. It's, um, you know, you take a boat ride 45 minutes to this middle of nowhere, this very remote island. And back then, I think about 300 people 
lived there. Um, and to my kind of teenage brain, I was like, who would live here? Like, what is this place? <laughs> um, you know, they have to take a boat to go grocery shopping and get their mail. And, you know, they didn't have, you couldn't just like go down to the Target and get a celebrity magazine, which to my teenage brain was everything, right? Um, so it was just fascinating to me. And I, I never really forgot that place, even though it's very little known to most people who don't live in Maryland. And then a couple years ago, I think I was working on You Were There Too. And I came across a newspaper article, as, as you do. And it was about um, a woman in Australia who's, this is a little bit morbid, so forgive me, whose husband had passed away. And she was in such grief about his death that she left him, his dead body, in their bed and continued to live her life, you know, in, in strong denial that he was dead and lived her life outwardly that everything was fine until a neighbor, you know, kind of smelled an odor, a strong odor coming from the house. Sorry, that's the morbid part and realized what was going on. Wow. And that newspaper article stuck with me for a very long time. Um, I just, you know, I'm fast, right. I'm fascinated by grief. People grieve so differently. Um, and I just, you know, it was just fascinating to me. So those things all blended up in my head. And I have The Invisible Husband of Frick Island, which is about a young woman named Piper who lives on this very small island in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. There's only about 90 people on this island. And she's a newlywed and she loses her husband to a freak boat accident in a thunderstorm one day. And in her grief uh, and, and denial about this, she wakes up and continues to live her life as though he is there beside her, fortunately without the dead body rotting in the, in the bed. Um, and the whole town, you know, they love Piper and they're not quite sure what to do about this. And so they decide the best thing to do is to go along with this delusion. And so everybody's waving to her husband, Tom, as she walks him down to the docks. Um, and that's all fine and well because they're a very insular, isolated town until a very ambitious young reporter named Anders comes over from the mainland. And instead of the fluff piece that he thinks he's working on, he notices a very different story, which is an entire town interacting with a man who does not actually exist. And he decides that this is going to be the big break he's been looking for for his podcast because he wants to be a famous journalist, a famous podcaster. And he decides to continue to go over to the island to get to the bottom of the story. And that's where he starts to unravel quite a few secrets that the townspeople do not want him to unravel. <laughs> it's so great. So I was fascinated by Frick Island when I, and the, literally the first thing I did when I finished your book was Google, like, is Frick Island real? <laughs> um, and <laughs> I think then I, I, I found maybe some place where you had talked about Smith Island and I was like, oh my gosh, now I have to Google Smith Island. Um, <laughs> and I loved how, you know, in the way you drew this island, there were traditions that were so important to families and they had lived there for generations and it was just the way things were. Um, and I was wondering if you, if there were details about Smith Island that you had wanted to include in the book, but couldn't find a place for, or how much of Frick Island is Smith Island? Yes, so there were so many details. I mean, Smith Island has been around, they, they trace back to the 1600s. And so generations upon generations have lived there. There's so much history. You know, the, even though they're Americans, their lives are so wildly different from yours and mine. Um, and I visited the island uh, twice more it, for research, you know, as I was doing the book and met so many lovely people out there. And it's just impossible to include it all. And not only was it impossible to include it all, but I wanted to be respectful of the people <laughs> living there and make it so clear that this was my own imagination. You know, all of the characters are out of my imagination. The out, um, the map of the town, which I, I got a map in my book, which is just like a, a childhood dream come true that I have a map in the front of my book. Um, but the layout of the town is completely different than the actual Smith Island. Um, but one of the details that I wish that I could have included more of is the Patois or the or the dialect that they have. I mean, they really have their own way of speaking. 
And I was able to include like one or two like really great phrases that that are not actually heard of in mainland America. Um, but I included, I think, 20 or so in the book club kit from Smith Island, like a glossary. Um, a few of them, I wrote them down. Um, so I would remember they call hide and seek, hide and switch. Um, sweets or desserts they call noogs, N-O-O-G-S. Um, they, go, they go muskrat hunting in the marshes and they call it ratten, um, which I'm from the South and that's probably what we call it in the South too. Um, the marshes and stuff they call guts. Um, and then the other really great thing about their dialect, they have this, and everybody on the island does it, there's this like, they talk backwards is what they call it. And so it's like this very exaggerated form of irony or sarcasm. So if you, <laughs> like they would say, um, I wrote down another example. They would say, if, if you say like, how does this look? They would go, that don't look right. But it means that looks really good. And everybody on the island knows that. But if you're from not there, you'd be like, well, they think it doesn't look good. <laughs> I mean, that's why? Amazing. Yeah. What if they really didn't think it looked good? How do you know the they difference? Well, that looks good. And then you'd be <laughs> really confused. <laughs> but I really, I wanted to include the backwards talking because I was so fascinated by it. And I had it in, in one of my earlier drafts and it just was so it didn't translate well, or I didn't write it well. It, it just wasn't coming across. So I decided probably better to take it out, but I just love it. It probably needed a lot of explanation, which is hard in a book yeah. to like set yeah. it up so much. Right. Um, so one of the things that I really love about your book is it's like a little bit mystery, a little bit love story, a little bit family story. Um, and I was wondering when you were writing it, did you have a genre in mind? Or were you looking to kind of cross genre the book? Yeah, my publisher probably wishes I did because it might make it easier to sell. Um, but I, I never have like a genre in mind. I mean, I guess like the overarching umbrella, of course, is women's fiction, which, you know, I'm not super fond of that term uh, in general. But, you know, I just, um, I just write what is, uh, appealing to me and what I want to read. And so, and I like a little bit of mystery that keeps the pages turning and you, I like it to be unpredictable and you don't know how it's gonna, gonna turn out. Um, but I love a little love story, you know, I love writing about love. And I think that I kind of have my own genre. I like to tell people that I write unconventional love stories, you know, so, um, they're not like your typical boy meets girl. And then they, you know, have some obstacles and then they, uh, you know, right off into the sunset, there's, they're just unconventional. There, there's always something, a little twist, a little bit different about the love story. Um, well, and I think one of what you just said, you didn't want, you know, or like not being able to predict things. And I felt like I wasn't able to predict how the story was going to end at all, which made it so much fun to read and like really page turning. Cause I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I need to figure out what's going to happen. Um, so without giving anything away, because I don't want there to be any spoilers, um, okay. but did you always know how this was going to end? I did not. I did not for a long time. I mean, I, I loved the premise um, and I, and I just, I don't know, I went back and forth so many times. And when I lit on the ending and I, and I knew, then I knew that that was the ending and I never wavered, um, but it took me quite some time to figure out, which is also one of the things I always take these kind of <laughs> very strange story premises. And that's kind of what I love about it is it's a challenge to me. Like if it's, if I know exactly, if I can see the book from beginning to end when I set out to write, then it's not interesting to me to write. Like I want it uh, to be a bit of a challenge. I want to have to figure it out and make it believable and figure out how I'm going to tie it all up. Um, so yeah, but I did not know at the outset <laughs> what was going to happen. So cool. Um, so another thing I loved about your novel was the structure. And I always think it's so interesting when novels have kind of um, just different kinds of structures to them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this one was an especially cool one because you interspersed these flashbacks that then gave insight into the timeline that was moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you structured the novel and, and you know, what your thought process was. Yeah, this so I- This sort of novelist question, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so with the, you mentioned the flashbacks and the flashbacks in this book are of Piper, who's the main character and her interactions with Tom, the invisible husband that she, um, you know, goes around behaving as though he is alive right beside her. And um, so one of the reasons I included the flashbacks is to kind of build the mystery of what happened, right? To keep the reader guessing, is Tom actually alive somewhere? It, you know, like what happened? Did he actually die on the boat? Um, and, but the other reason that I really knew I needed to include the flashbacks is because you have to, you know, Piper loved him so much and you have to really understand their relationship and their love and empathize with that to empathize with Piper and what she's going through in the present timeline of the story. Um, and so that was the main reason is to really show their relationship and their love so that the reader could connect to them as a couple. Makes a lot of sense. And I think it totally did everything that you set out for it to do. Thanks. <laughs> um, so as I was reading, I kind of noticed a theme in this book of missing parents, either mm. parents left or who died or who aren't there emotionally. Um, and then a kind of second theme of stand-in parents, like Andrew's stepdad, like Mrs. Olicki, who kind of stands in as a mom for Piper. And I was just wondering if there was anything that you were thinking about regarding parents or anything mm -hmm. larger you wanted to say about parenting when you were writing this book? Because I know you have four kids. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. That's a great question because I don't know if I was consciously. Um, I have two wonderful parents and I'm not just saying that because they're on the Zoom right now. Um, <laughs> they're great parents. I had a wonderful childhood. Um, you know, I have not experienced, you know, being a product of divorce or, or, you know, a parent death or anything like that. But I do think that, that your familial situation in childhood, uh, you know, shapes you, right? Like for better or for worse. And so I like to delve into people's art, my characters' backgrounds to kind of show where they came from, how they shaped into the characters they are. And, um, and then I think unconsciously, you know, this book really is about humans and, and how there is so much more that connects us um, than what separates us. And, you know, it's a story about, about love, like community love, not just romantic love, but like love, um, as a community and how you can create family out of community. And so I think the stand-in parents really kind of, you know, bloomed from that theme of the book. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the way the community kind of develops as a true family for Piper. Right. And, and adopted her in a sense. Right, exactly. So, yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of Piper, um, one of the details about her that I just thought was so interesting was that she loves insects. And yes. I was wondering um, how you chose that passion for her and also what your own personal feelings about insects are. Uh, I do not like them. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Um, the re yeah, I, I did choose that passion for her because, you know, not only did I want her to be well-rounded, but I wanted her to have a passion outside of her husband. I mean, she's wildly in love with her husband and I needed her to be, you know, a whole real person. Um, and her mom's a scientist, so it made sense that she would have some kind of interest in science having been around um, her mom's work. And I just thought um, the entomology would be great and a love of insects would be great and would also provide a lot of comic relief because Anders, the other protagonist, the reporter, does not like insects at all and is in fact quite terrified <laughs> of insects. And so it just led, uh, you know, to a lot of comic relief between the two of them when insects would appear and she wanted to, you know, pick them up and take them home and take care of them. And he was absolutely mortified. <laughs> their their seeds are so great. They're so funny. To me. Um, so in one area of this book, you talk about the concept of the emperor's new clothes, how everyone in this community is agreeing to something when even though they themselves, you know, can't see it. And mm -hmm. um, 
thinking about our broader society, I was wondering if you think that there are some Emperor's New Clothes moments like in society now. <laughs> yes, I do, but you're not going to get me to say <laughs> talk about them. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, so so we'll we'll move on to loss. How about that? Let's talk yes, about great. <laughs> um, so so you write about loss in this book a lot and how it affects people. And you were talking before about grief. Um, and both Piper and Tom's mother are grieving Tom's disappearance um, in the book. And you're also talking about the loss of a relationship that Anders was in that he's grieving and how that affects him daily. Um, and I was wondering what, what, why your focus or, or why you chose to focus those aspects of those characters on loss and and sort of what what you were saying about loss in in the way that they all responded and reacted to each other and to their their own circumstances that's a that's a great question um i think that a lot of my books um whether consciously or not have a theme of grief and loss running through them um and my best friend would tell you that's because i am obsessed with death <laughs> which may be true. <laughs> um, but I also think it's because I write books about the human condition. Like it's very interesting to me to write about things that all of us relate to and experience as a whole. Like, um, you know, no matter what your culture is or no matter, you know, what your differences are, we all are going to experience loss. That is the nature of life. And so um, what I, I don't want to like bombard readers with this like horrible maudlin sadness. And so what I like to do is, is talk about loss and, and look for the, the bright side of it, you know, look for everything that you can gain out of loss. And I think each of these characters kind of find that throughout the book. Yes, they all are going through some really hard losses, but they also, you know, find something beautiful and wonderful uh, and hopeful through that loss, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Did you see there was an article, maybe it was a year ago or something, about the fact that people who write, who read fiction um, are often more capable of handling loss in their own lives because they've experienced it so many times reading it, which I thought was I did. so I did, that, is, that was so fascinating. And I do think, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because I, I know when I read books and emotionally connect to them, I mean, I'm sobbing, I'm going through the gamut of emotions. It's like you have experience that in real life. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You at least get the echo of it. So you're like, oh wait, this is a feeling. I know this feeling. I this is, yes, yes. I can cope with this. Um, right. All right, so everyone out there, I see three questions in the Q&A box. So put them in there now because I've got one more question and then we're gonna move over there. So um, <laughs> my last question for you is, um, speaking of loss, this past year has been a year of loss for a lot of Americans and a lot of people around the world. And I was wondering how 2020 and the beginning of 2021 affected you as a writer. And if there was anything that you started writing during the past year and, or anything you, you stopped writing during the past year and how that how that the experiences of this time have kind of shaped your writing if they have at all. Yeah, um, so first of all, just, um, you know, logistically having four children at home in virtual school and, uh, you know, trying to navigate all of that. I'm sure a lot of parents out there <laughs> can empathize and understand and are probably nodding along. It made writing very, very difficult. Um, you know, my husband was working from home. He had to be on conference calls and all kinds of things. So it just naturally fell to me to be the homeschool teacher that I has, have never been called to be <laughs> and never <laughs> to be called to be again. Um, so that, you know, I definitely took probably a four or five month hiatus completely from writing, um, uh, which was challenging for me because that's also, you know, it's, it's um, cathartic to me to write. And so it's hard to, you know, have to step away from that. 
Um, but when I did get back into it, the book that I was working on, my next book, is also quite quirky and fun and joyful. And so that ended up being very cathartic in, in such a hard time to just kind of get lost in this world where COVID did not exist. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a pandemic raging on. And so it was really, really fun. But I would say the other the other hard thing, and I don't know if you experienced this, Jill, but um, you know, reading was quite a challenge for me for that first couple months. Like I just couldn't get involved in a book. I couldn't concentrate. I don't know um, what it was. And so that was tough for me because reading is also such a, uh, where I seek solace, you know, in tough times. And so that was, that was hard. I'm fully back now, but I know a lot of writers and readers kind of struggled with that in the beginning, especially. And are your kids back in school? Yes, they've been back since October. Well, now today's their last day. So we're in summer, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they're going back full time in the fall. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think a lot of writers I've spoken to had a really difficult time writing and reading and focusing. And it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, I think, rough to create when you, you're feeling so um, chaotic inside. Yes, yes, yeah, for sure. All right, so we've got six questions over here. So keep them coming. Um, but I'm just going to go down the list and ask you what we've got. All right. This says, this is from Christine. Um, it says, so excited. Ordered today from a foxtail. I have lived in Maryland and have not heard of that island. Sounds fascinating. And I love your book cover. Do you have any input on your cover? And also, what three things would you take on a deserted island? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so A, about living in Maryland and not having heard of the island. I mean, that's how small this place is. There are plenty of Marylanders who have not heard of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's quite common. Um, the cover question, I do have some. And Jill, I'm curious. I'm always curious with other authors, like if you have cover in <laughs> your author on your cover. Um, I have some, they generally send like three or four and then they have a favorite um, and hopefully it coincides with my favorite. Um, there have been instances where we've just gone back to the drawing board, but this cover uh, for Frick Island was one of the very first that they sent me and I, lo I loved it. I mean, it just so fits the book and suits the book. And of course, there's a lot of brainstorming that goes on before the designer, you know, where we send covers that we love and that we think would suit the book, um, that kind of thing. So how does it work for you when you have covers? Uh, Is it similar? similar? similar. Yeah. I, um, I think my publisher actually usually sends me the image that they really like and yeah. says, what do you think of this? And then a lot of times I'll offer like editorial tweaks or we'll talk about color or, or, you know, font or something like that. But um, yeah, you have great covers. Your covers are beautiful. Thank you. It's, it's all Putnam. Yeah. <laughs> they do a good job. I mean, this cover, I think is, it's just so memorable. Like, I don't think you, anyone would forget that cover. <laughs> um, okay. Next question from Lori. Are you typically a pantser or a plotter or a bit of both? P.S. I can't wait to read this book. Oh, thanks, Lori. Um, so for those who don't aren't familiar with those terms, pantser is somebody who writes by the seat of their pants. Um, and a plotter is the opposite, somebody who plots and kind of outlines every single chapter, you know, from A to Z before they sit down and start writing. Um, I am absolutely a pantser. I generally, you know, I know my characters. I know where I'm starting uh, the book. I generally know where it's going to end up or what I'm writing towards. So I have an A and a B um, and I have no idea how I'm gonna get from A to B. I have no idea how the middle is gonna go, um, which is an incredibly inefficient way to write. I do not recommend that anybody <laughs> write that way. It's just the way that, that works best for me. I can't help it. I wish it could be different. Um, what about you, Jill? <laughs> um, I've done it differently with different books. Mm -hmm. um, there are some books that I've plotted, though, out pretty extensively, but those actually tended to be, I did like um, a, a 
writer for hire children series that just mm-hmm. like I had to turn them out. So right. I had to, I had to plot them. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the, um, have the time to like actually get them done. Yeah. For my novels for adults, for the most part, I know a few points along the way mm-hmm. and then I write to connect them. Yeah. So mostly pantser. <laughs> mostly pantser. Um, okay. We have an anonymous question. Anonymous attendee. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> um, as a writer, what do you learn about the people around you and society during the writing process? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Um, you learn so much. I think one of the key characteristics to being a writer is being uh, hopefully quite observant about, you know, the people around you. My friends always joke when they <laughs> tell interesting stories like, are you taking notes on this? Are you, <laughs> you know, am I going to find this in a book? And sometimes the answer is yes. Um, so be careful what you say around me. But yeah, I just, um, you know, I don't know if I've l- it's hard to say that I've learned like these great lessons about society as a whole, but I think I've reinforced what, what my, uh, you know, kind of core belief is, which is that most people are, are good. And we all are kind of driven by the same things, you know, love and, and fear of something happening to the people that we love, you know, um, and, and that all of those things connect us. And so, um, you know, and really that's what I was kind of trying to say in this book is that there's just so much more that connects us than separates us. Um, and it's, and it's what I genuinely believe and what I'm hopefully teaching my kids to believe as well. So thank you. That was a great question. Yeah. Um, okay. This one is from Carrie. Do you have a favorite moment in the book that you feel characterizes either Piper or Anders? Oh, I have so many favorite (laughs) moments of, the book. Um, I think I don't want to give anything away. Um, yeah, I don't know if I want to if I want to give any specifics because I want it to all be fun and surprising. But I have a lot of good. I think the Anders Piper interactions they were really fun to write, um, and a lot of those probably would would be top top ten. And a lot of the uh, Perlo Lecky, the bed and breakfast owner, was a really fun. A uh, dynamic character to write, and so a lot of her scenes would be would be favorites as well. There are such great characters in that book. I mean, like every one of them. They're just all there. I I want to meet them all in real life. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, you have a question from Catherine. Hi, Colleen. You write so quickly. I know you're already working on your next book. We would love it if you could please share something about it with us. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Okay. So I want to disabuse anyone of the notion that I actually write quickly. I know it feels like I write quickly, but it generally takes me a year to a year and a half to write a book. It just so happens that the publishing process also takes that long. And so when I, um, (laughs) you know, right when you have a book come out, just because you've finished a book, it feels like you're churning them out but I assure you that I am not. And I actually need to plug in my computer before it dies. Hold on one second. I do not want a dead computer. No. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yes, I do not write quickly, but I appreciate you thinking that I do. And my next book, uh, the working title, which which could change, is it's currently called The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise. And the short kind of elevator pitch is it's about an 84-year-old woman who is a suspected international jewelry thief. And her um, college dropout 22-year-old caretaker um, who ends up on the lam uh, with her. They are on the lam together from the police. So it's kind of a road trip uh, caper and trying to figure out who this woman actually is. Oh, that's amazing. I cannot wait to see that. <laughs> it's very, very fun to write and I'm excited for people to read it. Um, so then Emily asked, can we get a spoiler about your next book? But I think you just <laughs> spoiled. <laughs> Jean wants to know what you are reading right now. Oh, um, 
what am, oh, I'm reading Laura Hankins, A Special Place for Women. So that just came out last week. Um, she is a really, really, not only a funny writer, she's a funny person in general. You, if you follow her on Instagram, she sings and plays the guitar and makes up songs. And she is just a hilarious person. Um, and this book is amazing because it's about an underground kind of woman's society and a reporter that infiltrates it. And so it's kind of this, um, got a lot of sharp insights on feminism and being a woman in today's society. And it's uh, so far, it's fascinating. I haven't read that one yet, but I read her first one, which yes, which is uh, great, <laughs> which is also great. Happy and you know it. Yes. What are you reading right now, Jill? I I just I'm looking around. Um, it's, I just finished. There it is. Um, for a for a a talk that I did a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, the Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano by Donna Freitas. Ooh, was that good? It was. It's really cool speaking about structure in novels, it's nine different possible outcomes that stem from this one situation in Rose Napolitano's life. And you wow. see all the different choices she could possibly make. And then where some of the characters merge and have their, and their like stories come back together and some of them don't. And then, um, it's really, it's just, it's really fascinating and really interesting. That sounds yeah. fast. I mean, that like makes my brain hurt as an author of how <laughs> they did that. That's crazy. Yeah, no. Was, I have to check that out. It was, it was really cool. Really cool. Yeah. And really fabulously written. Um, okay. You have a question from Kristen here that says, who would you choose to play the main characters in a Hollywood adaptation? Um, I usually hate this question because I never know, like I don't picture, but for this book, I love this question because when I was writing for Island, my husband and I were watching, you know, we, were, we binge all these different shows and we happened to be binging the Santa Clarita diet, which was a show um, with Drew Barrymore. It's a real campy show where she like turns into a suburban mom vampire um, and there's this, we're watching it and this kid is the next door neighbor and his name is Skylar in real life. His name is Skylar Jasando. And when I saw him on screen, I mean, I, it was like this whole moment. I was like, that is Anders in my book. I, I could just see mm -hmm. it so perfectly. And the even coolest part about this story is that when I finished Brick Island, I followed him on Instagram. He's like the most charming kid. He's probably 26. He lives out in LA and he's done like a lot of great indie work. Like he's just a really adorable um, actor. And so I messed I slipped into his DMS on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did. And it's, it's very out of character for me, but I was so convinced that he needed to play this character and so I you know told him how much I loved him as an actor and how I could only see him as Anders and he wrote me back <laughs> and he I know it was so exciting and he asked uh he asked me to send him a copy of the book so I did and I'm I'm waiting to hear back I mean who knows if he'll ever read it but it just made my whole you know my whole day that he wanted it and he was just so so charming and delightful and made me like him even more so yeah. if this ever ever gets made into a tv show or movie i really hope that he plays anders that is the best story and the best answer to this question i've ever heard <laughs> i know i'm like i'm so glad somebody asked that usually i have no idea um okay emily would like to know of all your books which is your favorite and why and also which one was the easiest to write oh my gosh um oh and then actually the next person down who is anonymous said what is your own favorite of your currently published books or is that like picking a favorite kid it, i was just gonna say that it's like picking a favorite kid and i think um you know, they're all, they all are so different to me for so different, you know, like I know who I was and I remember specific things about when I was writing that book and they represent, you know, just different parts of my life and different parts of my career. And it's so hard to pick a favorite. Um, 
the easiest book is is hard to say. The hardest book that I wrote was You Were There Too. Um, it took me the longest, the most drafts. I honestly, there were times when I thought that it was just going to end up in a in a trash can fire and never <laughs> see the light of day. Um, so that was definitely the hardest. I would say the other three, you know, hard, equal, you know, equally with each other, but definitely not as hard as You Were There Too. Yeah. It's so interesting. I feel like every time I start writing a novel, it's like, do I even know how to do this? I have to like relearn what I'm doing every time. Every time. I mean, it feels like it should get easier <laughs> as you go. And it's the <laughs> one career that it does not, unless we're doing something wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. You have a question from Charmaine who says, I'm choosing your book for my book club discussion. If you are available, do you visit book clubs to discuss your book? Um, and if so, what is the process? Yes, Charmaine, th first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Book clubs choosing my book uh, make my heart swell. That's the best thing ever. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to mention that I have a book club kit. If you go onto my author um, page on Penguin Random House, I'll also probably be posting it on Facebook. Um, so book club kits with, um, you know, food recommendations and drink recommendations and playlists. And like I mentioned that glossary of the Patois from, uh, from Smith Island, which is so fun. And then a lot of good discussion questions that can help get discussion moving for the book club. Um, I do visit book clubs when I can. And so all you have to do is go to my website and you can email me through the website. And if I am available, I will either uh, zoom in or come in person if it's in Atlanta and I'm free. Or the other thing that I've done is if you have your book club members send in, you know, five or six questions, then I can answer them in a video and you can play it, uh, you know, as a last resort for the, for the book club if I'm not available. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for choosing it. I appreciate it. All right. Um, we have one. Oh, no, we have a couple, two more questions. Okay. So I was just going to say, we only have a couple more questions. So if you have any more, put them in now. This is your last chance. Um, okay, this is from Anissa, who said, who wants to know who was the hardest character to write in this book and why. And then she said, looking forward to you coming to Greenville and FNF. Oh, yay. I'm looking forward to going to Greenville, which is where I grew up. So I can't wait to be back there in June. Um, I think the hardest character um, in this book was probably Piper only because, you know, there is quite a mystery involved. And so I, I couldn't reveal too much in her sections, but I needed to reveal enough so that you knew who she was and you empathized with her. Um, but that made her kind of challenging <laughs> to write, um, you know, having to hold back some things. Okay, and then this is from Ivan. He says, um, we see the wonderful finished product, but can you describe the hard work and mentally how challenging it is to write a novel? Um, <laughs> remember the blender we were talking about? <laughs> it feels like you're in the blender. <laughs> Did that accurately describe it? Um, no, it, it's, you know, and Jill, you know, this it's, it's, um, it's hard. I think who's the famous person that said, you know, writing is easy. You just cut a vein and bleed onto the, <laughs> to the typewriter. I mean, some days it does feel like that. It's dramatic, right. To say that because we're not, you know, we're not doing brain surgery or something like our lives could be a lot harder. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's a challenge. There's a lot of days when the words don't come and you feel like, you have no idea what you're doing and and do you even remember how to string words together into a sentence and you just have to continue to uh plow through that i assume that ivan's a writer for asking that question. <laughs> so, so ivan if you feel like that then you are doing it right <laughs> is what i can say <laughs> uh, okay this one is from ricky how did you come up with the ailment in close enough to touch loved the book hmm Thank you. Yeah, that was a really fun one uh, to come up with. So I, um, let me see if I can make the long story short. Basically, I knew I wanted to write about allergies because it was a very, you know, allergies have risen, you know, um, 
like 300% since 1997, particularly in children. Um, my nephew, you know, has or had severe uh, egg allergies and, and, you know, just kind of watching my sister go through that, like having a child that could die from eating a cupcake, like is a really kind of a traumatic thing as a parent. Parenting is hard enough. And I knew that I wanted to write about allergies, but as a novelist, you know, I, I didn't want to do, you know, you couldn't do like peanut butter or bee stings. You have to kind of kick it up a notch uh, to make it interesting. And so I just thought, um, you know, I don't know, it just occurred to me, what if somebody was allergic to other humans and what would that be like? I mean, you know, like so much of our life is about interaction and, and human touch. Um, and so it kind of, you know, snowballed from there. I once knew a guy in college who was allergic to himself. He like he's allergic to his own skin. So when his skin kind of flaked off, like, you know, it does into his eyes, he would have allergic reactions to his own self. That's fascinating. Right. Crazy. Probably, I mean, probably miserable for him, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, an outsider, that's really a lot of antihistamine eye drops, but yeah. Holy cow. People are, you know, like the human body. It's a thing. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, Emily, thank you for this note to me. I'm glad you enjoyed everything after. Um, okay. Christine wants to know from you, Colleen, um, have you ever started a book and completely changed the ending or had to start over? Yes, uh, you were there too. Um, and it's not that I even completely changed the ending. I always kind of knew where it was going to go, but I, I have 57 drafts of that book. <laughs> And computer, and that is not an exaggeration. Um, Literally, and, yeah, fifty-seven. I counted them up one day, and my mom um, always likes for me to make sure I tell everybody that she has read every single one of those drafts, and she gets the the you know trophy for mom of the year for doing that. I'm surprised she's still speaking to me. Yeah, but um, yeah, I started that book over. I mean, there were many, many times when I would throw away a hundred or hundred and fifty pages, and and go back to square one because I just, you know, I was determined to get it right. And I just, it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> I always say that for my book, More Than Words, the only, mm -hmm. there's one paragraph that I think survived the <sighs> vision process from the first draft to the finished book. Like I, I really <laughs> think it might be one paragraph. Yeah. So going back to Ivan's question, that's the painful <laughs> Right yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, all right. So I think we're at our last question, which is so excited to read this book. Um, you mentioned that your next novel is joyful. Can you give us a teaser of the joy? Um, yeah, I mean, the characters, you know, they're very disparate characters. I have an 84 year old woman who's from a completely different generation than a 22 year old girl and their interactions are very, were very, very fun to write. Um, the 84 year old reminds me a lot of my grandmother, um, which is one of the reasons I wrote it is kind of an homage to her. Um, actually kind of an, probably an amalgamation. Um, um, why can't I say that word? Um, of a lot of the the women in my life, my both of my grandmothers. Um, and <clears throat> so it felt like spending time with them, which was very fun for me. And I, I think that that probably will translate onto the page uh, to hopefully be fun for the reader. Sounds very exciting. And when is that coming out? Um, not until right now it's slated for February, 2023. So I get a nice little break <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to revise it and, you know, work on other things. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Um, well, before we stop, Jill, can you tell us what you're working on next? And for anybody who has not picked up Jill's book, latest book, Everything After, it is incredible. And if you loved You Were There Too, you will love Everything After. <laughs> um, so, Similar yeah. themes to that too. Yes. Yes. So what are you working on now? Um, so I'm working on a book right now. It's called Jupiter and Juno, tentatively. Um, I love that title. Thank you. And for the very first time, I'm dipping my toes into a little bit of historical fiction. So there are two storylines, two love stories, one that takes place in Italy in 1946, 
and mm-hmm. one that takes place in New York City in 2019. And um, throughout the book, you discover the connection between the couple in 1946 and the couple in 2019. I love that. And you went to Italy on your honeymoon, right? I did. Um, I went, so my, my father's family is from Italy, like a few generations back. My great grandparents came okay. to my from Italy. Um, my husband's mother was born in Rome. So he has a lot of family in Italy. So we went there on our honeymoon and I met a lot of his family. Some of them came over for our wedding, um, but yeah. some of them weren't able to. So, so I got to meet them and, um, that's actually on that trip. Somebody had mentioned to me that in 1946, Italy um, voted on whether or not to end their monarchy and nobility in general. And Mm -hmm. it was a big election and it was the first time women were allowed to vote on anything in Italy. And I just kept thinking, well, what if you were like the son or daughter of a count or a marquis or something? And then there's this big vote and all of a sudden you're like, oops, guess I'm not a count anymore. Like, right. oh my gosh, happened? that's wild. So that's, that's kind of where the seed of that book came from. I love that. I cannot wait to read it. Do you have a, do you have a tentative pub date for it yet? Um, I think also in 23. Awesome. Yes. I'm not Yay. sure. Maybe we'll be on tour together. In person, <laughs> Knock on wood. In person tour would be amazing. In person, in person that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, this was so much fun. Thank you again for inviting me to be part of your launch. I just it was love so good so for agreeing to do it. I appreciate it. Thank you. And Claire, is there anything else? Oh, there you are. Hello. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Colleen. Jill, thank you both so much. It was just such a wonderful conversation. I was like smiling the whole time. Y'all are, <laughs> y'all are so great. And yeah, just going ahead and putting in a plug for um, y'all to make another stop at Atlanta History Center in 2023 when it sounds like really great <laughs> things are happening. So we'd love to have you back, hopefully in person. Um, so thank you, thanks again to both of you, to everyone here tonight. Thank you for your great questions and for joining us. Um, I put in the chat the link to purchase um, both Colleen and Jill's new books. So uh, you have your weekend plans now. So you can order those from Foxtail Bookshop. And don't forget that Colleen will be at Foxtail this week on Thursday signing books. So if you get your order in uh, tonight or tomorrow, you can get yours um, um personalized. There we go. That's the word. Um, personalized. So don't, don't miss out on that. So we have a lot of great author talks coming up here at Atlanta History Center. I'm putting a link in the chat where you can find more information about those. So we have two next week. Um, on Tuesday, June 1st, we're going to be welcoming Lee Martin in conversation with Jessica Handler. And he is going to be discussing his memoir, Gone the Hard Road. And it's about um, his life growing up in the Midwest and the incredible sacrifices that his mother made um, to to make that possible. So it's a really, really touching memoir. I highly recommend that you join us. And then next week on Thursday, we're welcoming Ben Beard in conversation with Matthew Bernstein. He'll be discussing his book, The South Never Plays Itself. So if you're a film buff, that's the talk for you. He goes through a dizzying number of films in his book and talks about how the view of the South from across time and across the country changes significantly through film over the years. And Uh, Funnily enough, he thinks the most accurate depiction of the South is in Magic Mike. So if you want to join that talk and learn more, (laughs) um, that's next Thursday. Again, all that's at AtlantaHistoryCenter.com. Jill, Colleen, thank you both again so much. Colleen, congratulations. And Jill, congratulations to you on your uh, books. And good luck on the rest of your virtual tour. We're so happy to have been a stop on it. Thank you so much, Claire. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Good night, everyone.